Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining in on this webinar. Tonight's webinar topic is the all zirconia implant, specifically the Cera root system, a surprising bread and butter implant in your implant practice. I have a lot of material to cover tonight, so let's get started. What if there was an implant that completely, not virtually, but completely eliminated microgaps, did not require platform shifting, but allow soft and hard tissue integration from the apex to the most coronal part of the implant abutment complex, had no chance of screw loosening or fracture, was actually engineered for a successful immediate placement, preserved the most amount of hard and soft tissue in case of recession turned into the color of a natural tooth root, and was a very profitable implant. Often dismissed as too brittle or too weak, the cerarut zirconia implant is a thick, solid mass of well-engineered nutrient stabilized zirconia that delivers on all of the above, making it the surprising bread and butter implant in the armamentarium of any dental implant practice. So let's find out why. First of all, I'd like to get the disclaimers out of the way. I have no financial ties to cerarut. I have no financial compensation in any way, shape, or form by Sarah Root, so I report no conflict of interest. And also, there are no digital altering of the images. We're about to see some pretty fantastic results of soft tissue, et cetera, so uh, there have been no altering of those images. My experience, as mentioned, is uh, I'm a Mish prosthetic graduate, 2010, surgical fellowship in 11, ICI diplomat in 12, place about 500 plus implants. In my practice, full spectrum of soft and hard tissue augmentation, practice limited to comprehensive adult dentistry with a wellness focus. So let's look at the outline tonight. We're going to start off with a quick intro to Sarah Root. We're going to look at right off the bat the number one concern that we all have, which is strength. Is it strong enough? Is it too weak? Secondly, we're looking at the brittleness. Number three, the number third concern that many of us have is how well does it integrate? Then we'll look at a pivotal case that changed my mind. And of course, the heart of the presentation will be everyday cases, everyday bread and butter implants in your practice. Time permitting, we'll only look at a few cases. I wish we had, we had time to do more, but we'll only look at a few simple cases, uh, one moderate case, and a few advanced cases. Of course, we'll look at disadvantages. There is no implant system that doesn't have disadvantages. We'll look at some of the disadvantages as well. So by way of quick introduction, of the four commonly used types of zirconia, root is yttrium stabilized zirconia in the left-hand column, used in dental restorations, aerospace, and now used in dental implants. The root implant system is a very efficiently organized system that only needs five implants to cover all edentulous situations or fixed prosthesis. Starting from the left, we have the maxillary lateral or mandibular incisor implant. Next is the small to regular central incisor. Next is the regular to large central or canine implant or smaller space molar implant. Next is the most innovative implant, which is the hybrid press fit slash standard threaded implant, ideally for premolars. And finally, we have the molar implant. And we'll see these in action in this presentation. So in the interest of time, I'm not going to cover 30 slides of literature reviews on the, phys on the physical and biological properties of the yttria stabilized zirconia. If you're interested, I encourage you to take the time, as I have, and do the research yourself. There is a significant body of scientific literature out now on this material, and specifically the applications in dental implantology. So I will only very briefly outline one study to answer each of the main concerns. But again, there's a plethora of scientific knowledge out there on this topic. So in terms of strength, Mobilia et al. in uh, 2013 looked at the flexural strength. And they found it to be similar to many of the dental restorations that we use currently in dentistry, lava, coursera, zirconia, et cetera. And when we think of the you know, restoration that we're using routinely in dentistry, Bruxer, Total Zirconia, Roundhouse Bridges, et cetera, they are not failing in droves. And they are under much more load demand than a dental implant is. I'm going to take the liberty of saying that you are probably using yttrium stabilized zirconia in your, in your practice. And 
I'm going to again take the liberty and assume that it's not failing in droves. So this restoration does stand the test of time, has to the test of time to use for maybe eight to ten years now in dentistry fairly routinely, and there's plenty of literature on the topic. Let's look at the number two concern that many of us have. Is it brittle, too brittle? This is actually my personal bias against zirconia implants prior to learning about their engineering. Olivier in 2010 did a fairly significant study, 831 implants, 378 patients over five years, and they had a very good success rate comparable to titanium. Generally, there was no, no appreciable bone loss, and this means that really there was no excessive forces on the crestal bone, meaning that the implant was not too brittle. If it was too brittle, as we know, that there, there would be too much force. Uh, the implant would not, would not uh, you know, bend, would not have the um, elastic properties, would not bend on uh, the bone. The forces would be taken by the bone. There would be microfracture and hence bone loss. So let's look at some long-term cases and look for crestal bone loss. Here's a case that's been in the mouth seven years. And looking at the crestal bone loss again, we don't see we see good, good integrity. Here's another case, three years. Again, we're looking for crestal bone loss on the bridge here. Looks good. There's a four-year case. Um, a couple of implants, three implants on the right-hand side. Again, no bone loss. There's a five-year case. Again, good, good uh, crestal bone integrity, no crestal bone loss. In other case, a couple of other implants, different parts of the mouth that are incisor. We have a molar. Again, very little or no crustal bone loss. And here's a full mouth case. Again, there would be all kinds of vectors of force here. And if this implant was too brittle, either they would there would be fractures of the implant or more likely there'd be crestal bone loss. And again, we're just not seeing that crestal bone loss. So another main concern the top, so the top three rounding it out is does it integrate? How well does it integrate? We know titanium works well. How well does zirconia integrate? <clears throat> well, there again is a plethora of um, scientific uh, information um, research that has been done here on the biocompatibility of zirconia. I just chose one, for instance, to show you. I have another one as well, a 45-year review of biocompatibility of zirconia. So this is not a new, a new material. We've been looking at this for a long period of time, and the net summary is that it does not. It basically does not elicit a measurable or almost an immeasurable amount of um, you know, um, cytokine activity, of immune response. It's basically either non-measurable or just barely measurable according to the instruments that are available to measure the immune system reaction. So it's very, very biocompatible, more so than titanium. Many, many titanium studies, there is a measurable immune response, there is measurable inflammation, and uh, it's not clinically significant, but it's there, and in zirconia, it's almost not detectable. Does it integrate? Absolutely. Uh, again, in summary, it integrates extremely well. Osteoblasts form and propagate along the extracellular matrix without any problem at all. So plenty of literature out there if you wanted to sink your teeth into some more. Let's look at now some root advantages. Number one, Zero micro gap. We're going to look at all these closely. Number two, no need for platform shifting. The bone and gingival will attach to the entire implant abutment complex. No prosthetic clutter. It's actually one of the most prosthetically driven implants out there. There's no screw loosening or fracture to worry about. It is actually engineered for immediate placement although it can be placed in healed sites as well. It preserves the most amount of soft and hard tissue. In the case of recession, there is excellent aesthetics. And last but certainly not least, it's one of the most profitable implants out there. So let's look at each of these in detail. So micro gap, we know that there is a gap formation at the implant abutment junction, especially under load. And this micro leakage uh, can, of course, trap uh, bacteria and begin, can often begin a sequence, a domino effect of uh, peri 
implant mucositis, leading to perhaps peri-implantitis, and the assorted host of ill and ailing implants that we see in our practices. So again, zero micro gap here with the zirconia ceru implant on the left-hand side as is visible. It's a solid block from top to bottom. There is no junction. Because of that, of course, there's no need to platform shift. Platform shift, again, is uh, an innovative way to move the micro gap away from the crestal bone and to save 0 0.5 to 1 millimeters, perhaps, of distance, of distance, 0 0.5 to 1 millimeters distancing away from the, the crest of the bone from the micro gap. Again, no need to platform shift here. There is no micro gap. The entire you know, gingiva and bone will attach or integrate with the entire implant abutment complex. So these were immediate implants in 8 and 9 placed in October of 13. This is January 2014, four months later. And we can see that if I had placed the implants deeper, I didn't, of course, but if I had, the bone and, and the gingiva would have adhered to the entire complex of this implant from head, from, you know, head to toe, from top to bottom. This was June 2014, some, I guess, nine months uh, after surgery. And there's an excess of tissue attached to the entire implant abutment complex. Now, if this was a titanium abutment, in my experience, this tissue would most likely have receded down to the biological width with the implant abutment margin. If it was a titanium implant and the abutments were zirconia, so if you use titanium but then use a zirconia abutment, Possibly the tissue would adhere better and not recede. However, there would still be that implant abutment margin and the risk of microleakage and recession. Plus the fact that the entire implant abutment complex in root is osteointegrative, plus soft tissue supporting, this is an obvious advantage. Prosthetic peace of mind, another advantage. On the left, we see the root system. Pretty well, that's it. There's the implant, there's an analog, and there's something called a Sarah crown. We'll come back to that in a minute. On the right-hand side is what many of us have in our offices. We have our tackle boxes and drawers and uh, other, yeah, other sorts of organization systems where we have all kinds of parts and pieces over the years for this and that use and uh, this and that system. And um, there's just can be a great complexity of parts and pieces. The root system, okay, what you're seeing in the middle is a serra crown, which are prefabricated zirconia cores, and they have two functions. Number one, they're pickup impression coatings. Number two, they provide a core for the direct ceramic overlaying technique. So very, very simple prosthetic technique. Now, I haven't used the serra crown yet. I haven't seen the need for it, but I could see that they would be very useful in the aesthetic zone. And I'm actually looking forward to trying one in some cases. So very simple prosthetic system. Also one of the most prosthetically driven implant systems. So the abutment on this implant has what I'll call in quotations as CEJ. Okay, thus immediately you are drawn into thinking prosthetically. When placing this implant as an immediate, you judge your depth of placement by the CEJ of the adjacent teeth and the smile design. It just doesn't get more prosthetic than that. At the time of surgery, you're thinking prosthetically, as well as surgically, but you're very much conscientious of the prosthetics. If you don't have primary stability in the anterior, then what you do is you splint the adjacent teeth, but you don't compromise your CEJ to CEJ relationship. Because this will compromise aesthetics, of course. In a non-aesthetic zone, you can place the implant a bit deeper and have more wiggle room in order to get better stability, but you're always thinking prosthetically. So we'll see this again under the profitability advantage. No screw loosening and fracture. Well, that's pretty self-explanatory. There are no screws to loosen and there are no screws to fracture. Simple as that. Engineered for Im immediates. Okay, so although this can be placed in heel heel sites, this system really shines in immediate implant dentistry. This is the molar, and as we can see at the base, it's at its narrowest, it's 4.8 millimeters, almost 5 millimeters in diameter. 
at the where the threads end and the sort of transition or crestal part of the implant begins. Where the threads end, by the way, that's where you want to um, place in bone. So the threads should be covered in bone and everything above that can be super, super crestal. Where the gingiva lies to that is going to be independent, uh, going to be dependent on the case, of course. But because of the width of this implant, this the implant has very little difficulty engaging either buccal wing or major distal bone, and it's very predictable to get good primary stability uh, of this implant for medias. Here's the anterior central incisor implant. Again, you can see at its narrowest, it's 4.1 millimeters. Where it engages at the crest of the bone, it should be about 4.8 millimeters, almost 5 millimeters in diameter. And an immediate, that's beautiful. Then you have 4 millimeters there of wiggle room. You can place it a little bit deeper, a little bit shallow, shallower, depending on adjacent to EJ. So lots of flexibility, lots of wiggle room, but you are thinking prosthetically uh, and surgically at the same time. Now why this preserves the most amount of soft and hard tissue, not only is it so so large, um, this is another advantage, a distinct advantage, um, a different advantage uh, technically than the, than, than the uh, design for immediate. Because it's designed for immediate, it preserves the most amount of soft and hard tissue. When does the tooth have the most amount of soft and hard tissue? When does the site have the most amount of soft and hard tissue? It has it when there is a tooth present, and unless the tooth is significantly compromised with soft and hard tissue, assuming it's not, assuming it's a root, a failed root canal, a fractured tooth, etc., then this tooth preserves the most amount of soft and hard tissue. This, this implant system. What happens in the case of recession? Well. It's still pretty aesthetic. Recession occurs, of course, and in this case, we see the um, second premolar as recession, and the implant was placed, the CEJ of the implant was placed, the CEJ of the adjacent teeth. That is the proper, correct placement of this implant. A little bit of white that's showing. 99% of patients are not going to mind that, especially in the non-aesthetic zone. And over time, this is going to look uh, even more and more healthy and natural. It becomes ivory, actually ivory color. So even in case of recession, we're good in 99% of the time. On the right-hand side, of course, we've all been there with titanium. We've all seen this. This is in this is in our practices. Very difficult situation to manage. There aren't many good options. A uh, number of surgeries have been done here, and again, we've just we've all been here. And when there's aesthetic, when there's recession, the aesthetic so with titanium, it's just not a good situation to manage. So this is an, this is an obvious advantage of steroids. Another advantage is, as the, uh, I believe it's one of the most profitable implants. Of course, it can't, you know, there may be more profitable systems out there. There's a million different implant systems, but this is one of the most profitable implant systems out there. Let's look at a scenario, scenario here. I'm going to use Canadian dollars. I'm going to use the numbers that are prevalent in my area. Of course, every area is going to be somewhat different. So, um, you know, not uh, by, bypassing the differences in the area. Let's just look at some numbers. It would be impossible to have numbers that would be valid. Uh, across the board. So looking at the surgical aspect of it, removing the tooth approximately to 250. The placement of the implant is approximately $2,000. 1600 is professional fee, 400 is materials. So that's about 2250 and about one hour of chair time. Again, these are just approximate numbers. In most of our practices, this would, this would be sort of what would, what would be the case. Prosthetically, uh, about an hour and a half to maybe two 45 minute appointments. And the prosthetic fee for uh, an implant is about $2,000 again in, this, in my neck of the woods. So a total of about $4,250 and two and a half hours of chair time. So that gives about $1,700 an hour. Let's look at the uh, ceramic, the stero root system. On the surgical end, the paper really needs to, it's about $250. The implant is about $2,900, $400 for materials, so that's about $3,300. Why the being so much higher? Well, because this includes a what I call a custom surgical abutment. What you're seeing here, well, I refer to it as a custom surgical abutment. I've done enough of you now to know that I'm so conscientious of the prosthetics as I'm doing this that I'm manipulating the prosthetics with my surgery. Depth, major distal placement, occlusal clearance, incisal edge position, you name it. This is a thinking prosthetic implant, custom surgical um, abutment done at the time of the surgery, therefore I pay for it. 
So one hour of share time, the total is about 35.50. The prosthetic side, uh, again, about an hour and a half, 45 minutes times two. It's a little less, of course, because the abutment has already been feed, but $1,200, let's say, for a crown. So the total is 47.50, two and a half hours, about $1,900 an hour, so about $200 an hour more than titanium. However, this is not including two other factors. Number one, there is no two-stage surgery here. So over a year, placing these type of implants, there's significantly less chair time. That's going to make it more profitable. And secondly, because chair root is engineered for immediate, the healing time is reduced, as we are not waiting for the socket to heal prior to placing the implant. Thus, again, over a year, in terms of productivity, each case has many fewer months of lag, meaning more cases can be completed in a given year, which obviously is more profitable. So these two factors are not evident in these numbers, which are making them more profitable. Now let's get, look at the uh, case that changed my mind. Tooth number 14 had external root resorption and was becoming asymptomatic. Was becoming symptomatic. I'm sorry. The patient also wanted an implant in 15 to fill out the face. There's a situation. A fair bit of recession on that tooth. Uh, external root resorption and uh, the tooth behind the edentulus as well. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, looking at this CT, I would not be doing an immediate here with a titanium. The buccal bone loss with that tooth in place is just too unpredictable for me. But I wanted to see what the root engineering and zirconia biocompatibility could do. So we decided to go ahead and do it the 14 as a uh, immediate. Here's the position 15. There were six millimeters under the sinus, so I chose to use the shortest implant I had to minimize the depth of the indirect sinus augmentation. So I used the six by nine by horizons. Cerarute's shortest implant is 10 millimeters, so that is why I chose not to use the Cerarute because I want the shorter implant. So this is a nice combo case. Back to the clinical picks. Let me ask you, turn the question over to you. If you were going to do the 14 as an immediate with titanium, where would the implant shoulder be ending? Likely, likely be ending roughly three millimeters below this received gingival margin. Obviously based on various other factors, but let's just use three millimeters below this received gingival margin as a position for the implant shoulder to end. That now forms the start of the micro gap. How cleansable is that margin? How much further soft and hard tissue deterioration will we see over time? Let's consider platform, platform shifting. Will 0.5 to 1 millimeter per platform shifting really make much difference? What about the implant crown ratio? It would be something like maybe 1 to 2 versus the 2 to 1, which is ideal. So approximately four times worse implant to crown ratio than a titanium, whether an immediate or deal. What kind of force magnification does that put on the implant or the abutment, implant abutment margin, regardless of the engineering of that interface? Great force magnifications. So here's the restored result. And this is the case, again, that changed my mind. Now let's look at the obvious advantages of steroid root in this situation. Number one, as an immediate tooth 14, with all that recession and buckle bone loss, Look how the soft and hard tissue regenerated alongside a large zirconium implant placed right in the middle of all that. If 14 was titanium, the prosthetic interface would be, say, 3 millimeters subgingival versus the prosthetic interface of the root implant. So which one will your patient be able to maintain better over the long run? Number three, let's consider the implant to crown ratio. If titanium, it would be, like we said, say one to two. With the root implant, it is basically the ideal ratio of approximately two to one. Okay, let's look at the case side by side again to appreciate the impact that this case made on me. Look at the soft tissue gain at 14. This was possible because at the time of the extraction and immediate placement, I made a very conservative, nothing aggressive, Submucosal tissue release to allow some coronal advancement, place adequate amount of buccal allograft, and let the biology, the root engineering, and the zirconia ultra biocompatibility act themselves out. 
here are the radiographs, again, zero micrograph, zero microgap, super gingival restoration margin on 14. The patient can maintain this on a bad day. Again, this was the case that changed my mind. The possibilities and the options available to me were phenomenal. Now, just in case you think that I was a one-off and everyone can have a lucky day and every system can have a can shine on any given day. This was not just a one-off per day. I have other there are other examples of this. You can see anytime there's recession, you do not have to bury the implant. You match the CEJ, you put the thread in bone and then you match the CEJ of that implant to the adjacent CEJs and you let the biology take over and it works. Time and time again the uh, serum root engineering works very, very well. It's not just a one-time case that changed my mind. There are many other cases like it. Okay, now let's um, switch our attention over to the heart of the presentation, some bread and butter cases. Okay, we'll start with some simple cases. So here's another case, 214, chronic apical periodontitis. The patient refused root canal, wanted a ceramic implant. Found this on the internet, actually, searching for ceramic implants. This is a everyday simple implant dentistry where a serum root allows predictable and surprising bread and butter success, profitability and fun. So the angle in this looks like it's placed uh, much deeper than it actually is. And we'll see them in this knot. This is December 2013, again, an immediate placement. This is April 2014, four months later. Beautiful soft tissue response. Hey, sorry for this photo. It's fuzzy. I was having camera problems around this time in, in April of this year. It was driving me crazy. But um, again, look at the soft tissue response. It's very, very healthy, very good. Uh, I was using retraction cord here, triple O. So the placement of this was just at the marginal, marginal, mar uh, gingival margin. Very, very, uh, very ideal gingival placement. A very straightforward, not complicated, low overhead. Impression, triple tray here. The implant comes with prepped margins, so you don't have to do anything. Um, beautiful prep margins. I don't know about you, but I couldn't prep a molar like that on my best day. I just love seeing these molars, um, these, these implants impressed. Can your lab, you think your lab can make you a uh, beautiful restoration, good fitting restoration with that kind of uh, margin? Well, of course, they could do it, they could do it in their sleep. So here's the final result. Again, I'm sorry for the blurry photos. Very natural aesthetic result. Very difficult to tell which tooth is the implant. And to my eyes, the gingival response has been 100% of the time better in the zirconia cases than in picking. Here's another bread and butter case. Tooth number four, acute irreversible pulpitis. Patient declined root canal. Uh, in atraumatic extraction. Now, this is the Cerarut 14. It's the uh, this amazing piece of engineering. I just want to spend a couple of minutes on this. The apical half is cylindrical. The coronal half is elliptical, or more precise, more precisely, it's premolar shaped. Therefore, this hybrid implant cannot be torqued down as usual. It needs to be tapped in like a press fit implant. But the threads will engage bone, so it avoids the usual pitfalls of press fit implants. Okay, sorry for the blurry photo. The implant is placed here. Here we see, I use my instrument to see how much space I have, buccal angular, to give me an idea of how much allograft I need. And here's the case uh, post surgery, just at the end of the surgical appointment. So this is March 2014. Yeah, this is the um, ideal positioning of this implant. You can see that the CEJ of the implant is not at the crest of the bone. It's above the crest of the bone. The threads are buried in bone, and you have a pretty good transition area from threads to the CEJ, which gives you the wiggle room to determine how much depth you need to place based on a whole variety of factors. This is four months um, post-op. We're ready for impressions here. There's a little bit too much uh, gingival coverage on the palatal, so, but on the buccal it was beautiful. Ideal. The perio test, if you're not familiar with the perio test, is a great objective quantifiable assessment of osteointegration. Uh, I would think it's also a great aid in the case of medical legal uh, disputes, so I encourage you to look into the perio test and if you don't already have one. 
So we used diode laser here and got a great impression. Again, you'll have to make this a great fitting crown here on a bad day. Here is the final crown and the day of, uh, the day of seating. Again, everything's looking really, really healthy and natural. Now, what if you don't get um, 35 newton centimeters? I just placed this implant last week and the premolar was unusually wide. The implant fit into the extraction socket with finger pressure alone. So I tapped the 1.4 implant in deeper than I would have liked knowing that I'll have to use uh, the diode to take my impression. But I wanted to show, uh, what I wanted to show here is how I splinted this implant to the molar behind it. I used a global composite with no etcher bond, just pure mechanical splinting. I could have splinted it to do with mesial, but since the molar behind the implant is not an inclusion, I thought it would be the most non-mobile tooth to which to splint. But I could easily have bonded it to the adjacent tooth and it would have worked. So splinting to adjacent teeth is a nice trick to have in your pocket when doing these immediate implants as a matter of routine practice. Okay, let's switch to some moderate difficulty cases. Um, here's another everyday bread and butter dentistry, patients broken and fractured, um, tooth number 14 and 13, both unrestorable, patients also missing 12. Okay, plenty of height, plenty of uh, width, of course, because these are there. This is uh, immediately post-extraction, uh, as atraumatic as possible. Here we have the two implants placed, a molar and a premolar, and we've skipped the ponic site. We have placed allograft into the ponic site, and um, this is November 2013. The patient walks in with two you know, bombed-out, unrestorable teeth and has two surgical extractions, socket preservation, two immediate implants, all very atraumatic, no sedation. We scheduled about maybe an hour and a half of this, and the collection was about 6500 so approximately $4,300 an hour, which is quite profitable. And it's a great service to the patient. It's a huge practice builder. Here's the radiograph. Here is one week post-op. So again, patient walks into your practice, you know, requiring two um, you know, complicated extractions. They walk out weak walk out as they were a week later to come back, but there's almost no redness, no inflammation. There's almost nothing um, going on, amiss going on, no indication that anything has really been done other than seeing those sutures uh, and looking there, which would draw one to, uh, to suspicion as to see what happened. This is two months later. You can see phenomenal uh, aesthetics here, soft tissue, tissue, soft tissue uh, reaction. Again, with immediate implants, generally you can, um, it allows good implant placement and uh, Cerarute allows good draw without a CT guide. So this is four months post-surgery. I didn't need any lockout here. Uh, these, these implants drew uh, quite reasonably. And here are, here's the post-insert uh, seating, making sure that there's no cement. So again, um, great predictable result. This is seven months after surgery. I think we'd all be pretty happy with that. I think this, uh, she's not talking to all her friends about her metal-free dental implants. You bet. She's very, very happy. It's a great practice builder. Okay, and um, in terms of time, let's keep on going to our advanced cases now. This is the first anterior case I'm showing you, and this is where most of us probably initially thought the Sarah root implant would be used almost entirely. If you're like me, before learning about this implant, I thought this would be a niche implant. That it would only be used in these you know, rare aesthetic anterior cases. But I hope thus far I've shown you a few cases where I think this implant really shines, which is actually in the non-aesthetic bread and butter zone. If I had the time, I'd show dozens more bread and butter implant cases. But now let's turn our attention to some more advanced cases here. Okay, so um, this was a new patient referred to us uh, from internal referral, tooth number nine. Uh, decay below the gum line, patient declined, crown lengthening and root canal post coron crown. There's the radiograph. So as we know, the incisal edge of the implant should be in line with the incisal edge of the adjacent teeth for cement retained crown. I'm showing this picture here because uh, of a, uh, a mistake that I made here. I placed too much mineros. There's too much mineros placed, uh, especially on the power. It looks right up to the CJ of the implant. It should not be there. It should just be about where the threads end, or just slightly prone to where the threads end. You want the soft tissue in contact with that transition zone 
so that the soft tissue forms a, a seal and heals and closes over the bone, closes over your, your aloe graft and the, the bone that has just been, uh, just had the osteotomy implant placed. And so you do not want to place mineral all the way up to the CEJ of the implant. This is the conclusion of the, of the surgery, which is April 2013. I made a chair-side um, um, composite global veneer here for him and try to get a cool clearance, of course. This is one week later. It wasn't the most artistic dentistry I've done, but at suture removal, note how I left the temp short of the implant CEJ to allow the gingival overgrowth for this roughened acid surface. As we saw earlier, this is one of the major advantages of the seru in that if you bury the whole implant, including the abutment into bone, the whole thing is osteointegrated, and it would integrate along the entire length of the implant. Um, stating this point simply to highlight the advantages of zirconia and how soft and hard tissue friendly it is. So you want to leave it short of the margin and let the soft tissue grow in. And this case actually was my very first seru case. So let's look at some of the, some of the things I could have done better. The implant, first of all, is placed too deep. And um, I used the 21 implant, which is the small to regular central incisor. I should have used the 11, which is for larger central incisors. Obviously, this is a larger central incisor. Now, if I had done that, I would likely have reached 35 newton centimeter, and I would not need to splint the implant. I could have used the ethics, which likely would have uh, given us better soft tissue. We're going to see that we've lost some, we will lose some of this mesial bone later on, I think, because of the um, the uh, temporary that I made. This is three months post-surgery, and this is four months after surgery. In this case, I elected to go with a um, uh, to go with a, uh, a lab fabricated uh, guide, um, a prep guide, a reduction guide here. So I generally try not to do that. And this is. Now, the final result, 14 months post-surgery. Again, let's look at some critiques. Um, number nine is wider than eight. Patient decided not to veneer the 10 to match the seven. But the larger challenge for me here is how to overcome the pure whiteness of the zirconia button underneath. You can use a chroma-rich synthetic cement like barrier length A4. You can have your lab make an A35 Emax coping, then veneer layer over top. Alternatively, you could use the Sera root crown, or the, the Sera crown, the A1 zirconia coping. So there are different options here, and this is a challenge that I'm still enjoying working out. This is the PA 14 months later. Lost a little bit of bone in the mesial, I think, because of the soft tissue uh, complications with my temp. However, um, looking at the pre-op and the degree of inflammation in the distal papilla of 9, there was a good chance of recession anyway and um, some unfavorable soft tissue healing. Although we did lose some distal papilla on the 9, I think most patients or clinicians would be very happy with the soft tissue healing from an immediate implant. This was my very first case. Let's look at some other advanced cases. Here is another advanced implant case that is still underway due to finances. Uh, eight and nine are failing root canals and the patient is unhappy with the aesthetics. She has declined retreatment of the endos. Here's the atraumatic um, extractions. I'm trying in the countersink to see if the Sarah Root 21 or the Sarah Root 11 is the right implant here. This is the Sarah Root 21 countersink. The broad gray line is the CEJ of the implant okay, on that Sarah Root. So uh, on this countersink, the broad gray line is the, it represents the CEJ of the implant. So at this depth, I'm about 2 to 3 millimeters coronal. So by the time I place the implant and torque it down, I will get great primary stability. So that's the benefit of the counters and that's exactly what it's meant to, meant to do. This is the um, initial placement of the implant by hand, which is at an ideal level to start, and uh, maybe seeing one thread as a guideline to start. This is a stock photo, obviously, showing the special uh, ceramic driver, which torques in the implant by motor, or you have the traditional manual torque wrench option. This is the final depth placement. I've matched the CEJs of the implant to the canines, again, thinking of the ideal smile design. As you know, uh, as we mentioned, for cement retained crowns, we're looking for the implants to pass through the incisal edge of the crown. Holograph is used. I use um, I prefer Minerox from BioHorizons. So, end of surgery here, October 2013. Patient left with uh, an Essex. 
is the PAs. It's one week later. I kept the sutures in as proof because I myself couldn't believe the gingival response one week post-op. Post -op. And this is typical for steroid I mean, It just doesn't look like anything really happened there. You're wondering what the sutures are doing there. At least these are my impressions. I looked back in my files and I said, well, let's, let's compare. Let's compare this to other immediate titanium implants that I've placed in virtually the same exact clinical scenario. There, there are significant aesthetic and management differences. So here are two titanium implants placed immediately. The titanium case was finished up with a connected tissue socket seal technique taken from the two durosities. The same titanium case again seven months later after old eight pontics were used on the flipper to get decent soft tissue architecture. Nine months post-surgery, of course, a second state surgery is needed, say temporary plastic abutments. Temporization of 10 anterior units for a smile uh, enhancement case. In the end, a reasonably aesthetic result, but you know, many more steps. And look at the soft tissue appearance of eight and nine. Back to the serra root in the same scenario, I think we can see the obvious soft tissue and restorative advantages. This is after just one surgery and no prosthetic intervention to get this in, to get this gingival contouring and architecture. The patient is happily wearing a slipper while waiting for her investments to mature. Alternatively, at this point, I could make her some polished lab temp crowns. Note the position of the implant CEJ is about one millimeter subgingival, giving us great leeway to align our crown CEJ with the canines. Based on the final position of the crown margin spatially, we can either leave the canine gingival height where it is, or do some subepithelial connective tissue grafting to get the root coverage again, depending on the patient's overall treatment acceptance of the laterals in this case, or not, not to uh, include the laterals. So like any quarterback loves to have, there are a number of wide receivers open here for, for adults, and that's just the case thing to have. Here is a very aesthetically conscious young female patient who, despite all efforts, refused ortho, tried to put her in a headlock, couldn't work, she refused ortho, and wanted a quick fix, a real type B personality. So here's what she wants. She wants her primary upper canines and her palatally trapped permanent canines extracted and, and metal-free implants, plus veneers, no ortho. Now I don't know about you, but with titanium, I would never attempt this as an immediate. There would just be far too much risk involved. The treatment plan would be extractions, pocket preservation, implants, restore. Remarkably, this is one week post-op. I leave the sutures in there as proof, both to you and really to myself, that I am still amazed by the body's soft tissue reaction to this material. This is still one week post-op. I've simply removed the sutures and replaced the patient's awful ethics with a suck down uh, temporary teeth on the canines. No cement, just um, uh, PDS molds taken before and suck down, suck down is made. Again, I could not imagine getting this result one week post-op, doing two extractions in one site and then placing an immediate implant. So we're now waiting uh, for the four months and then we're going to proceed with an anterior eight uh, smile face. The patient is very happy. Of course, there are disadvantages. Let's look at those. Uh, this is not an implant for beginners. There, this is a one-piece implant, including the abutment. So naturally, you need great 3D placement, including buccolingual. Um, you know, it's best not to prep the abutment. Okay, don't forget the abutment is also the implant. They're one and the same. So if you're prepping the abutment, you're prepping the implant. So last case scenario, you should be prepping the abutment. This should not be your first line of, um, you know, of action is to pick up your handpiece. Okay, we need abundant bone. We can see the serra root, they're wide, thick, big blocks of zirconium. That's why they're so strong. That's why they don't fracture. And they're only available as fixed restoration. They're not available as removables. So those are the disadvantages of the serra root system. Let's finish with one last case, uh, a bread and butter case combining zirconia and titanium. So last but not least, uh, by now, just in case you have the feeling that I think every implant should be zirconium, um, that's not the case. I want to include this case here. As mentioned before, in my implant practice, it's not just one or the other. It is time and place for both. Here we have a patient missing tooth 20 with division B bone. 
and 19 is fractured at the gum line. Patient declined bone, rege bone uh, regeneration, didn't want balance, and et cetera. So how would you handle this case? Using a very sharp starter drill from Salvin, we were able to start the osteotomy by splitting the interradicular bone. So we see the advantages of steroid as an immediate here. Um, and we see the advantage of the 3.0 diameter um, BioHorizons laser lock implant. Both of them side by side, serving um, the patient very well. This is the finished case the, uh, at the end, of, uh, the end of surgery. Note that the steroid implant was placed about two to three millimeters deeper than the ideal. In this case, um, I don't know if you could see, but there was moderate generalized loss of the cleaver vertical dimension. So I chose to place the implant deeper versus prepping the occlusal. And here is the finished result. Uh, again, sorry for the halo, but again, a very nice uh, result for the patient. So in summary, we looked at the number one concern of strength and weakness. You know, the fracture toughness is similar to LAVA, similar to Zircad, similar to Bruxer, the Pritau Bridges. These, these products have been serving the profession well uh, for some time. And those restorations are under far greater vectors of force than the implant. And they're not breaking in growths. So that concern is, is handled. Now, second concern is one I had again was brittleness. Again, we saw three, four, five, six, seven year follow up x rays not showing significant crestal bone loss uh, or implant factors. So that, that, that concern is handled. The, Number three, third third concern of osteointegration, we saw there's you know forty-five year review, there's just too much uh, scientific body of information to look at it. There's a tremendous amount of support for the osteointegration of zirconia, the biocompatibility of zirconia. So that's not a concern. We saw that it's actually engineered for immediates, although it can be used in healed sites, it chimes in engineer in immediates. This is great for the patient, one surgery, less wait time. Great for us, it's a great practice builder, it's a very profitable implant. You know, what do you get when you add predictability and profitability? To me, you get fun. So it's a lot of fun doing these implants. Probably my favorite procedure not to do. Contrary to what I thought when I started, this is not a niche implant. I thought this would be an implant I'd use one out of 10 times, one out of 20 times. It's not. It's actually a surprising bread and butter implant uh, to have in your implant practice. So what will the future hold? Strawman has released, um, uh, has launched a real, quote, breakthrough. I use breakthrough in, um, in quotes here called Rock Solid, a hybrid titanium zirconia implant. Uh, I applaud Strawman as the first major implant company to foray into the arena of zirconia and implants. My take on this is that this is really the beginning of the large implant companies seeing the validity and utility of the zirconia implants and starting you know, with a hybrid. See, friends, what I um, haven't shared with you about this implant system is that it has been created, engineered, researched, and brought to you by um, by a father and his two sons. Doctors Oliva have put in their own blood, sweat, and tears into creating this company, uh, a real true American-style entrepreneurial startup. They've taken their product to the free market in an environment dominated by the big boys of dental implantology. So I hope this webinar has given you some excitement to be able to help your patients grow your practice, expand your implant practice, making it more predictable, profitable, and above all, keeping you young. I, for one, am more than happy to be buying my implant from Sarah Root, support this family business, and I wish them all the entrepreneurial success in the world as their cloning implants join alongside titanium in serving the profession.